called her the miracle of the 90s. Three years ago, she was unknown. Today, they can't stop talking about her. No other actress has captured the imagination of the Indian middle classes quite as she has. But what's the lady behind the image like? Well, let's see if we find out as I introduce you to Nandita Das. Welcome to the program, Nandita. Thank you. Tell me, are you surprised, pleased, or just a little disconcerted by your sudden popularity? Um, I think I've gone through a whole process of emotions and understanding of the whole thing. When I came into this, which was by default, I think I was far more naive. I thought it's like any other profession where you go, you work, and you're back home. So, um, at times I'm pleased when I feel somebody's really talking about the work and not just saying because your photograph has come into Delhi Times or you feature in a program with Karam Thapar or something like that. Uh, there are times which upset me. Earlier I used to be angry almost because I used to think it's such a superficial thing. They don't know you, they don't care really about you. They come for your autograph, suddenly you are in strange mailing lists of people who just two years ago would have just, you know, looked at me and just uh, sort of passed through me. So I think. It, it, it one should know that it is an artificial, superficial profession to some extent, that it's very transient, this popularity, it's there today, it's gone tomorrow. But so are you growing to like it now that it's there? No, I'm just growing to like my work and also not liking certain things. So I'm not sort of taken in. I think if you don't take yourself too seriously, then you neither love it or hate it. Now you said you, it all happened by default. So is it true that you never actually trained to be an actress, you just drifted into it? Totally, because in fact I did my bachelor's in geography and my master's in social work. So it was, uh, I did a bit of acting. I uh, did with Saftar Hashmi's group called Jannatya Manch. But at that time the focus was not so much acting. It was more the issues that one took up. I think one was far more idealistic. And I really believed that we could change, you know, the world, the society with these little street plays that we did in various nook and corners. So again at that time it wasn't so much for acting. But I think I always enjoyed performing arts. I mean... You know, one did various things that were connected to that. So, um, I think it was really, really by default. But you know, you talk about default. There's a story which says that even Fire, the movie that catapulted you to fame, actually happened by accident. Totally. I had gone to Bombay, in fact, uh, for another serial by Madhura Jasrat, Pandit Jasrat's wife, and uh, uh, which didn't materialize because it was a long serial, long as in 52 episodes, <laughs> which is like short serial by today's standards. And that's when our daughter mentioned uh, Gulshan Grover's name, and I obviously didn't know him from Adams. And You've uh, never heard of Gulshan Grover? I mean, I've heard of him, of course, but I didn't know him, and I thought, oh, the bad man, and you know, <laughs> who wants to go and meet him for a role, and uh, yeah, he was very nice, and he talked to me about another American film, which I finally didn't do. It didn't sound interesting at all, and just as I was leaving, he said, well, there's this other film by a lady called Deepa Mehta, but it's a bold film. And I still date, I don't know why I said, okay, I'll go and meet her, because I hadn't met up with any director <coughs> on my own. Was it the phrase bold uh, film? Was no, it a sort of I challenge? I think there was, there was an article in India today or something that I'd read about Meera Nair and Deepa Mehta, and where she had talked about this film called Camilla, and I sort of vaguely remembered that it sounded interesting. So I thought, okay, let me just go and find out, and I went there and... So literally we curiosity got the better of you? Probably, or just destiny, or I don't know why. <laughs> but I went and met her hesitatingly with an envelope with photographs taken by various friends. So they were all sizes and, you know, kind of mm, strange. And uh, I knocked at the door and I, she, she didn't even look at me actually. And later she told me she'd seen seven actresses that day and she was quite sick of this whole process. And she said, let's go down to the lobby. And uh, I said, is that Dupatta from Fab India? That's an ad for Fab India. <laughs> but I actually said, is that the Patta from Fab India? And she said, yes, why didn't you come in? And I thought, what a strange lady. You mean the Dupatta did the trick? Uh, I don't know. Later she said it was just that I was uh, stupid and spontaneous, probably. <laughs> that, you know, you don't know the person. And say, is that the Patta from Fab India? So I think uh, something clicked and we just... You know, became friends as people. We didn't. I didn't even know whether I was going to do this. This is an amazing series of accidents, things happening without intention. Do Absolutely. you believe in destiny? Uh, no and yes. Uh, I, my mind tells me that you know it's all in our hands and we are doing. And I, at some level, I truly believe that uh, things can happen. We, but we, it's it's in our control. Uh, control probably is too big a word, but I think that circumstances happen. It's up to us how we change them or what we do with them. There are times when things happen that you don't quite comprehend or you go to a place and you meet somebody and you say maybe there is something to it which is larger than what we know of. But you know the amazing thing is you don't have a career plan like most people do. You just let life happen one totally. step at a time. What's the point of planning in any case? I mean, 
anything can happen any time. So I, I definitely don't play it like a game of chess and you say, okay, I think I should do this because then I will get that or maybe it will help me to do something else. I just live, live each day as it comes. But you live each day as it comes and you got but the best part and the best movie happening in 97. But fire ended up for good or bad reasons being controversial. Was it a courageous decision to act in it? Well, when I got the script, I, I just liked the script. I didn't see it as a film only on lesbianism, you know. For me, it was a film about choices, about love. But did that aspect worry you? Uh, it didn't worry. I mean, I did think that there are going to be people who are not going to like it at all, or there are going to be people who are going to say, my God, what kind of a film are you doing? But I didn't expect it to blow out of proportion the way it happened. And I think it wouldn't have happened had a small section of the society hadn't, you know, uh, done it the way they did, because for three weeks it was running successfully or whatever. I mean, at least there were no hassles, there were no problems by the audience, so to say. It was just at the end of the third week that a group of people decided to break the cinema hall and, you know, almost catch hold of people by their collars and say, you're not going to go and see that. Of course, film. that protest made the film, didn't it? Because suddenly uh, everyone saw everyone it and became aware yeah. of it. Well, made the film, I don't know. There was also an overkill. I think there was so much talk about it. There was so much happened that everybody felt that they knew the film and there were some people who didn't go and watch and there were some people who were curious about it and did. But I think what was nice that it generated a lot of debate. A lot of things that we shove under the carpet sort of suddenly came out, whether it was about freedom of expression, whether it was about lesbianism, whether it was a censorship. You know, so I think in a way it was it generated a lot of things that needed to be talked about. Yeah, it's interesting you use the phrase overkill. Many people who saw your next film, Earth, which is again by coincidence with Deepa Mehta film, felt that your performance there as the maid was much better. Would you agree with them? Do you think that you were better in Earth? I think what I have learned through this experience, one thing I can say that watching a film is the most subjective thing. I know people who have said that, oh, Fire was a much better film than Earth. And there are people who said Earth is much better. Or they like a particular scene and there are, there are people who hate just that scene. So but I can't you judge very, your own performance? Don't you get a buzz inside you? It's a, diff it's a totally different kind of a role. In fact, when Deepa gave me the script of Earth, she said, look, you don't have to do it just because, you know, we have worked together and we are friends. And in the role in Earth, I thought, wasn't as challenging as the role in Fire because, you know, she's the same throughout. It's the things around her that keep changing to which she reacts. But to be honest, I found it more difficult to do Earth than to do Fire because in Fire, she's a very spontaneous, impulsive kind of a person and, you know, she just reacts from the heart and to a large extent, I'm like that. Whereas in Earth, it's a thin line that she's walking, even though she's the same person, she is aware of her sexuality, of, uh, of uh, you know, the charm that she has on these men. And yet, it's not in a manipulative way, it's in a childlike way. And this is something you can't act out. You can't try and be sensuous and be unaware. You have to become the role? No, you just, you just hope that what you're doing is right. I have no idea how it happens. So it, it had different challenges and it would be difficult for me to say which is better. Tell me about the roles you choose because there's a distinct impression that you create that you're a serious actress who looks for substantial roles. I know, as if I only do these arty, boring, issue-based No, but not arty, boring, <laughs> but roles that have meaning and substance rather than mm -hmm. flippant and vacuous. Well, I think in every person there are various sides. And as in me, I mean, I would love to do a fun film which has a lot of humor. And because I think all of us... You get offered them? Sorry? Do you get offered them? No. <laughs> the image, the image is the wrong one. With, uh, so that's why I insist on saying that in the hope that somebody will come up with an interesting fun story. No, because a fun meaning is something like Jane Bido Yaro or Chashme Badur. They were, you know, there was good cinema and yet it was, it was an enjoyable experience. So, but I think when I choose a role, it's more the story. It's not so much the role because I think no role is really in isolation. I would rather do a smaller role in a film that I believed in than to do this role which has all the histrionics but, you know, is part of a story that where my heart isn't. So, it, and so I see the story, I see the director because it's a lot to do with the vision of the director, how he or she is translating that story into a film. And finally, it's something totally intangible, you know, it's just... Something that just clicks inside you. Yeah, you just meet the person and you say, okay, I think this person's going to make a sincere film or... And not that all my decisions have been correct. I've, you know, I've done. So things. is that what went wrong with movies like Man, Lagan, or even Kama Sutra? Lagan they didn't click. No, I think there were all different reasons. Kama Sutra, I didn't do because I didn't think I felt comfortable with the kind of uh, exposure that the film required. Also, it was. Were you being prudish? 
maybe, maybe. No, I don't think true. It's just uh, one is in a context it's of the society. You. It's like I just uh, see. Also in fire, it wasn't like it wasn't a bold scene, and there weren't things to do. That you know, like there was a scene which was a topless scene, and I told Deepa that I don't think I'm comfortable doing it. If you can get somebody to do a body double. Uh, and if I'm watching it and seeing what I'm supposed to be doing, I'd be fine. And that's what we did finally. But it 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 tackled issues that I think I felt strongly about, and I felt I could defend it. Whereas Kama Sutra was, is a subject that I don't feel that strongly about to say it's a do or die situation. That I am going to defend it till the last day. You know, until you are not so sure, not so confident about the issue, then why fight for it? And what so went wrong with Man and Lagan? Man, uh, it was a nice story, but. While we were talking, and it it was very smooth. I mean, there are no hard feelings at all with the director or the producer. But I just felt the way that wanted to translate that story into a film wasn't quite like the way I had seen it, and I felt that I wouldn't be comfortable. Was it too with Bollywood it. for you? A bit. <laughs> Do you have I a sort of reservation mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. becoming what they call in popular tabloids a commercial actress? I think the lines between commercial and art are really blurring. I mean, there aren't any. You know, um, there, there's probably a hardcore commercial cinema. So what puts you off Bollywood? Uh, I wouldn't say Bollywood because I mean, if you see some other film, I've done a film called Axe, you know, which is more within the commercial genre. I'm doing a film with Mahesh Manjrekar, which is again a Sanjay Dutt Mahesh Manjrekar film, which everybody's saying, oh, so finally you've gone into the commercial way, and they're telling Mahesh, so you've taken Nandita, so is that an RT film? So I think it's about you know from what perspective you're looking at. So I, I don't think I look down upon commercial cinema or anything. I would be just as bored to do a pretentious, boring art film because there is also that. Group of filmmaking, you know. So I just want to do films that I can relate to, that I think make sense to me. I have very strong views about certain things. I get disturbed about certain things, and if that film touches upon that, then obviously I get sort of drawn to it instinctively. Again, it's not a game of chess where I think I think I should do this, or you know. You've also done lots of regional mm. cinema. In fact, if I'm right, you've acted in some four or five different languages. Is yes. that a challenge you set yourself, or are you determined to just diversify as well? No, it's just the way it's happened. Again, it's just happened in the sense of destiny a, leading you without your knowledge. Well, a, a Malayalam director comes or a Bengali director comes, and if I like the story and I like the sincerity of the person or the mind of that person, I say, well, you know, I'm not going to keep waiting. For, and I think in India we do have so many languages. We ha do have so many stories. We do have so much talent which is outside Bombay and Hindi films. So why not just dabble with that? And But I you are therefore serious when languages. you say that life is a current and you let yourself literally flow with it. There's no pre-planning. Flow with it and yet make choices. I mean, these are all choices that have been consciously, consciously as in made. You see, your instinct is also to do with your mind and your heart. I mean, now I can sit and talk to you and try and put them in brackets, but it doesn't work that way. For me, my heart and my brain, it's really together. I mean, I. If it's a totally cerebral, intellectually a right film, or somebody is saying the right things, but it's not coming from the heart, it doesn't work for me. Or if it's something where it's only emotional and you do a, you know, you go through a catharsis process and it doesn't touch your mind, it again doesn't work for me. So wherever these two work together, I do it, and I don't make language a barrier. Let's take a break, then, Nandita. I want to come back in part two and talk about another aspect of your life, another side of you that we know much less about. Hopefully, you tell us a little bit more about that. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. Stick with us. Welcome back. My guest is Nandita Das. I believe you were in Ahmedabad on the day the horrible earthquake happened. Was it frightening? Yes, you bet it was. I mean, I was in this NID guest house where I'd gone to visit my brother with my family, and my father was in another building on the tenth floor. And luckily, I didn't know it was the tenth floor. Otherwise, I think I would have panicked much more. It wasn't so much the fear of death because you know when I think when you're trying to escape, there is a sense of hope, and your your mind is just in trying to get out of that place. But it seemed like it lasted forever because. The, you know, to realize it, then to run down the staircase where the plaster is falling, the glasses are sort of shaking, the whole earth is, and to come out and still sort of sway for quite a while and see these buildings cracking, and you know, it was it was dreadfully fearful. What was worse was after that, the fact that it could happen again, and not to know whether it's going to be worse or lesser, and to be constantly in that fear that it could happen any minute. So just when you're thinking everything is settled and you want to go back to your room to maybe get a sweater because it's cold or to get your chapels or something, and yet to know that what if I'm inside and it can happen again? Fear so really stays here. Fear you. and that helplessness that it's something you have no control over, that you know it could, and and then of course the story started pouring in that this building has collapsed and that has, and the whole city had this strange feeling where there were buildings that were completely intact, 
and there was traffic that was going as normal. And then there was this building which 10 floors had just gone down and there were people, hundreds of people in that debris. It was just a very... In fact, Gujarat is a part of the world you know very well because before you began acting, you did a lot of social work in Gujarat. You have a master's in social work and you spent several years working with children. How did you get into that? Uh, when I did my geography, which was also just because I had a wonderful teacher and I did my bachelor's, and then the only thing my parents ever told me about studying was that you're a good student, the least you can do is an MA. So I said, okay, but I don't know which subject to do it in. And I took a year off. I said, I just want to take a year off, travel, and decide what I want to study in. Because most often, one just keeps studying without even knowing so why we're doing it. So what drew you to social work? So I, I worked in a school called Rishi Valley in the south, where you know I, I just uh, taught children fifth class students just all the subjects and did some plays and dance and all that and I realized I wanted to do something where I was dealing with people I just didn't want to get into academics pure academics and that's when I did my masters in social work and at the end of the first year I went and uh, went to Gujarat and uh, worked in a Gandhian organization my mother comes from a Gandhian background both my grandparents were in the national movement and all that so I decided to go and work there and this at the end deep of in the interior of Gujarat yeah it was a tribal village what's the work was it it was an educational work. Again, it was to work with children and, uh, you know, to go into families. And they did a lot of developmental work. So I did that with them. And at the end of my two years of master's, I went to Orissa to a tribal pocket to do activist, to work with an activist organization. I just wanted to see these two sides of uh, social work because maybe I was studying and one was exposed to, uh, you know, various facets of social work. So then I thought it would be a nice difference to know how developmental Gandhian approaches done and how activists and they were working more in terms of environment in trying to get minimum wage for people who do these leaves these tendu leaves and you know they get about 11 rupees after working i mean making about that many tendu pata and in fact when you came back to delhi you also worked in what they call slum colonies with organizations like ankur and alaripu ankur, uh, ankur was working with women so that was more uh, sort of an activist kind of a thing but through literacy literacy classes and sewing stitching classes but I think I was too idealistic and sort of too taken in by the whole thing and I just couldn't handle the dichotomy that exists in our lives which are far more protected, far better, you know, where the brother and sister are dealt with, not as a girl and a what boy. What drives you to this sort of work? Is it a commitment? Is it a need to have to give back? Is it a mission? It's no mission. It's just something just from... Yeah, it's just me. I mean, I just enjoy it. I, it. One also does it for oneself. That's why when I shifted to Alaripu, which was to work with children, I did it for a completely selfish reason because I couldn't handle the difference that existed in the slum with the women and in my own life. And I thought I want to work with children because they give you so much joy, there's so much more honesty, Do you feel it's less complicated. Do you have a sort of bond with children? Yes, I just love children. I've been lucky, I've worked with lots of kids even in films and uh, I just think they're so much, not just pure, but just so much full of life, so less complicated and less caught up with our adult kind of way of thinking, of balancing things, of doing saying the right thing, the kind of pretense that one has to go through. So I think working with children... Children are natural. Absolutely. And now that you're a major actress, do you still have time for this social work and for children or is it sadly a thing of the past? I don't know about major, I beg to differ, but the <laughs> thing is that uh, definitely it's got become less. I mean, I wanted to simultaneously do much more work with kids and, you know, in that field doing workshops with school teachers because I think then it sort of filters down to a larger group of children. Uh, I'm doing less and less, but I'm still continuing. I, whenever I get time or whenever I can, I attend seminars or work, do workshops with kids. Would you consider, for instance, going back to Gujarat now that this horrible tragedy has happened and helping in some way there? Absolutely, but I keep reading that going back may not be of so much help because I think we'd be also, you know, uh, using the same resources that are there for so few people there. So I think sending stuff and making sure that it reaches to the right people, doing coordination work, at least being in Delhi, one must and one really should. And I've already begun talking to some people. Let's talk a little about you personally. Your father is Jatin Das, the painter. Your mother is an accomplished writer. What sort of childhood did you have? Well, like a childhood one would have of parents like that, which meant, uh, you know, reading a lot of books, going to plays, going to dance performances, music you know, having friends of parents who were very who conscious that. about exposing you to the good things of life. They weren't Dance. conscious. They just said that dabble in everything. I mean, learn Odyssey not to become a dancer, learn music not to become a musician, but just to have a more rounded growth. And I'm really happy that my parents thought that studies wasn't the only thing to do. Is this why you said somewhere that you had a tension-free childhood? 
Well, tension free in terms of education, yes, because I think uh, there were no pressures of coming first, of you know, taking up science because your marks are good, or why do geography? I mean, what are you going to do after that? There were no such pressures. The pressure were the only thing they ever said was do whatever you do, enjoy it and do it well. You know, so that, that was, and that's I was the lucky, sort of motto that you made your own, isn't it? I'm going to enjoy everything I do and give the most of it. Yeah, and not worry about specialization. Tomorrow, if acting doesn't happen, I don't get the kind of roles I want to do, or I don't enjoy it enough, or the baggage of it is more than the work itself, then I'll probably pack my bags and do something else. But you know, in the midst of this advice from your parents and this almost idyllic childhood, they also separated when you were seven. Was yes. that difficult for you? Yes, it was, and as much as it's difficult for, I think, any child going through that parental tension, but I think they were, they were nice in understanding us and not being sort of at loggerheads, and uh, luckily both my parents were in Delhi, so I could spend time with both my parents off and on. And uh, I don't want to go too much in detail because I think uh, even a person in a public medium has a right to privacy. Absolutely. <laughs> Are you a shy, reserved person? Do you like to create your own environment or do you make friends easily? I make friends easily. I, I bond with people. But uh, I'm, at the same time, I'm, you know, I like my own space. I like to be quiet with my own self. I do a bit of pottery, which I think is very therapeutic because one is constantly, whether you're working with children or you're doing films, you're constantly with people. So that gives you some moments of uh, peace. Pottery I have a couple of close on friends. Own. That's when I'm, I have a wheel at home. And I have some very few close friends whom I really, you know, talk my heart out. But otherwise, I, I do make friends easily. But you need a little bit of time to yourself just to be Absolutely. with your thoughts. I think all of us do. We just, it's just that we give less and less time to ourselves. But sometimes happens to me and I say, oh, I, maybe I should do some yoga. Maybe I should, you know, because I'm not a very religious person. But I think um, all of us need some time to meditate, which only means disciplining the mind and just, you know, just having a zero mind, which we, I think a lot. So I think one never really has a zero mind. So I'm working towards it. <laughs> Gira Nanta, you've had a very rich life. You've done so many different things and you've had the courage to explore them and to let life's currents take you in whatever direction they flow. But now what? Do you have a dream or a target? No dream. I mean, I had a dream and it sort of lingers on some way of starting a school in some place. I don't know. Definitely not Delhi, Bombay and these big cities, but in a smaller place. Is, it, is children the attraction? Yeah. Yes. And maybe by then I would have a couple and a uh, couple of children can study with them and, you know, just have a holistic education like the way I saw in Rishi Valley, where, you know, which, which is only for privileged children, but have a school where you do gardening and pottery and music and dance and teach and also the values because I think what we are heading towards is a very scary society where we are just being corroded by many basic values. And I think that happens when you sort of inculcate that in childhood. So I think that probably something like that I would love to do. Well, I don't know if it will happen. Let's hope this is one <laughs> dream that comes true for you. Thank but you. not too soon because we want to see a lot more of you on the screen. I'm first. not going away too soon either. So. Thank you for a Thanks. wonderful interview. Thanks, Karen.